There's loads of great stuff in this episode, but listen, before we get going, I would love it if you could subscribe, but as well as that, just hit the notification bell as well, because as soon as there's a new episode or something fresh from all of us, you will get it first. But for now, grab a pen and paper, because I think you might need to make some notes on this episode. It's full of brilliant takeaways. Enjoy. Here we go. Hi there, I'm Jay Comfrey, and this is High Performance, where we delve into the minds of the most successful athletes, visionaries, entrepreneurs, and artists on the planet, unlock the unspoken secrets to their success to help you follow in their footsteps. Professor Damien Hughes, the wind beneath my wings, is with me. And look, Damien, if it's people with a positive growth mindset, um, talking and playing football, well, they're two of our favourite things. So I think we're, I think we're going to enjoy today. I'm really looking forward to it, Jake. Uh, when I was doing some of the research for it in preparation, uh, I was reminded of a quote from one of our previous guests, Clive Woodward, who said that winning doesn't happen in straight lines. And I think that's true of all high performers, that there's bumps along the road. And today's guest has, has certainly taken a the scenic route to the top, and I'm really excited to hear more about that with them. Okay, let's do it then, because here at the High Performance Podcast, we believe that it's time to rethink footballers. It's our national sport, right? Little old England has created the best league in the world, yet we don't celebrate it. We deride footballers, we criticise their wealth, we seize on any little mistake they make. We make very few allowances for young, gifted, highly judged teenagers competing on the world stage. Yet from Frank Lampard to Rio Ferdinand, Tyrone Nings to Stephen Gerrard, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer to Maurizio Pochettino, this podcast has so far proved there is so much more to our footballers than we allow ourselves to believe. It's time they were just unboxed. However, for that to happen, I think we need to be asking different questions and they need to allow themselves to be vulnerable. So let's welcome a Premier League captain, a Premier League winner, a man for whom football has been an ever-present in his life. He might be the son of a legend, but we want to find out how he created his own story, how he forged his path, how he fought, how he failed, but crucially, how he didn't lose faith. So get ready for a conversation, not about football, but about life with Kasper Schmeichel. Welcome to the High Performance Podcast, Kasper. Thank you very much. Thank you for the uh, the nice intro there. Um, yeah, I'm uh, really excited to be here. So what is High Performance? To me, high performance is performing to the maximum of your capabilities to be realistic with what's uh, achievable with someone uh, for, for someone of, that has your, your skills and uh, to absolutely maximize every single minute of every day to achieve your goals. Right. You know, what I find interesting about that answer is when you talk about being realistic. Yeah, I've heard you say somewhere else so I know that you said you always believed you would win the Premier League right so is that a realistic target well it was and it is definitely <laughs> but it's quite a mindset isn't it if you talk about realism and that's your realism maybe, maybe believe, that's the key if I don't believe it who is going to believe it that's that was always that's always my mindset so I think in elite sport you're never going to be given anything so People will always, you know, tear you down and they'll always find a reason to not believe you. So you have to have that much inner belief in your own abilities. And obviously with it being a team game, you, you, you're, you're controlled a little bit by where you are and, and the circumstances you're in. But for some reason, and, and I can't tell you why, and when you delve into it, maybe it's maybe it's got something to do with winning was was very normal in my family. Um, so the standard was kind of set. And uh, for some reason, I always had this inner belief that, that one day I would win the Premier League. And um, that, uh, that was something where I was, I always had it in my head, uh, didn't really speak it. And um, the people around me knew, you know, that I believed it and, and that was fine for me. And it, it really came, came hitting home one day. I was, I was doing a, um, I was doing a speech at my, uh, at my old school. And, um, this was probably about 2012, 2013, maybe something like that. And, um, I was writing this, uh, along with, with my, uh, performance psychologist, I was writing, 
you know what you know the, the kind of things I wanted to say, the messages I wanted to get across, and um, we wrote it, and it was really good. And then I show I, I showed it to my dad, or I performed it, whatever you want to call it, to my dad, and he was kind of like, well, it's really good, but I think you're missing something. And I was like, well, what what, what do you mean? You keep going around saying that you believe that you'll win the Premier League. But have you ever dared to actually say it publicly, put your neck on the line and say that you'll do it? I was like, no, I haven't. So he said, well, this is a perfect opportunity. You're going back to your old school. Wow. Say, if you believe it, say it. So I made a promise to them that the next time I'd come back, I'd have won the Premier League. So that the whole I did the whole speech and I finished with a picture um, that I had of me when I was younger with the Premier League. And I, I said to them, next time I come back here, I will have won this. And um, and yeah, and lo and behold, it it it, it happened. But um, yeah, it was a it, it's it's one of those things when you then do it, uh, you want it again. Yeah. More, more and more. There's nothing. There's no feeling like it. There's nothing that can that can replace that feeling of winning. So can I ask you then, Casper, that a lot of people might have dreams or aspirations, but lack the courage to ever articulate them like you described you did up until that speech why do you think that is well i think it, it's the it's the fear of of failing and you you talked before about daring to be vulnerable this was me being vulnerable because if this didn't come to fruition i i you know i'd, I'd probably look a bit you know like i wasn't realistic and you know and and, I, and it did get some funny looks of course it did you know, we were playing it in the championship at the time uh, for, for Leicester. So, so I think that it's it's daring to be vulnerable and say those things. And 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 for me now, the goal is still to win the Premier League. The goal is still to win trophies, even more so. That desire is is so much more. It's so much more relentless now. And and my my motivation every day since the day we won that 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 trophy is is just. I I didn't think it could get bigger, but it's just. That feeling, you want it again, you need it again in your life, and uh, and I think we're we're on a really really good path at the moment. I feel like that we 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 at Leicester at the moment are are working towards those things, and and being part of that process is uh, is is fantastic. And then having the, you know, being at a different stage in my life now, a more experienced player, you know, to to be a part of of a young team that's coming through and and performing really well and with with great great potential is really exciting. I, I think that this is an example, isn't it, of where self-talk can be really beneficial. And I, we, we discuss self-talk and the language you use in your own head really often on this podcast. But I still believe 95% of people underestimate actually how important it is. I wonder whether if we go back into the Leicester dressing room in April 2016, whether that inner self-belief that you always knew you were going to win the Premier League was almost quite grounding for you and, and it you almost felt like, of course, we're nearly winning the Premier League because I've always believed this was going to happen. And how how beneficial all those years of telling yourself that this was what was going to happen to you actually proved when it really mattered. I think the the, the ability to convince yourself of of something is, is so important because, like I say, if you don't believe it yourself, then you, you, no one else is going to believe you. You can't convince anyone else. So you have to be so so steadfast in your convictions that that I am this is what I'm going to do and this is the way I'm going to do it and I was lucky that I grew up with with a father who had done these things that's where the beneficial side has been because I was able to see firsthand the sacrifices you know the training you know the the eating the resting all the things you have to do all the the stuff you see you, you don't see all the stuff away from football the life you have to live it's boring sometimes it's incredibly boring but it's a process and and to get to where you want to be you have to go through this process and i saw that firsthand and i was lucky that i had access to some of the greatest footballers this league, the Premier League has ever seen in Manchester United to to actually be there and watch training, be in the dressing room and 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 hearing these guys and seeing them, seeing the the work ethic, you know that relentless drive and striving for perfection, um, the real harsh environment that that winning requires, uh, that that rubs off off on you and um, and in my head I was always telling, oh this is what I want, I want this that this is the life I want to win these things I've seen these 
incredible achievements from the inside and I've seen what they do, the feeling that it gives you. And I was only, a, you know, I didn't play the games. I was just saw, I, I was a part of a family, but what it did to everybody around the club, what it did to the people, you, you know, you, you're driving home, I'm sitting in the back of the car and there's thousands of people, you know, clamoring around my dad's car. This is what this means to people. This It means the world to people. So that that was just ingrained in me from there. I, you know, I wanted to be a part of that and I wanted to have that that responsibility of of making these people happy, like having a, a fan base really support you that much and, and have it mean so much to people that when they go to work the next day, the, the result that they've just witnessed will depend on what their week's going to be like. Um, that was always fascinating to me. And, and like I say, to see that from the inside, see the, 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 the personalities and the, the people you know, actually execute these things was, uh, was inspiring. See, your background really intrigues me, though, Casper, because when I was reading about it, you know, that whilst you grew up in Manchester during your adolescent years, you come from a Danish family. So that utilitarian uh, thing that everybody is equal, you know, it's a, it's a society that, that, that prizes well-being as much as the outcome. You know, then you've gone into Manchester United during the most successful period of the club's history, as well as then going to Portugal when that sort of coaching renaissance was starting there. And all of those factors must have influenced you. So what would you say are the biggest lessons you learned during the adolescent period that shaped the person you are today? Um, I would say take nothing for granted, be thankful, be grateful. Um, it, it's something that that I always uh, think about. Is is I do feel extremely grateful for everything I have in my life, um, and I grew up extremely privileged. And I talk a, a lot to to friends about this. You know how how do you grow up privileged and still be thankful? You know when things, you know are, are you know no, I've never needed anything in my life. So that's maybe been the trigger for me to to go and work for something that nothing, no one can buy me, no one can give it me. I, only I can do it. Um, so that grounding of 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 being in a in a in a in a loving, comfortable family environment, uh, being able to then to to go and 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 do and achieve something on my own that nobody could set me up to do no one could could help me along the way and and to play in a position like a goalkeeper where i am solely responsible for for every action and every er error that i make uh that that is probably where uh, one of the biggest lessons see but that's really interesting because we almost have this narrative that for people to to succeed they often have to struggle you know and it's like that that famous joe louis quote that it's hard to get up and run when you're wearing silk pajamas, and yet you've just described that you did grow up in a yeah, world of privilege. So, what was it in you? World. I grew up in a world of privilege, but I struggled massively with many, many things. You know, it was as 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 great as it was sometimes to be the son of of Peter Schmeichel and and have that kind of access. As as horrible it was as well. You know, if when I went to school in Portugal, for you know, to take an example, being 12, 13 years old, if Sporting Lisbon lost, I wasn't going to school on Monday. That just wasn't happening because it was that was the, the fanatical culture. It meant the world to these people, and if they saw me, their frustrations would vent to me. You know that. You know what was your dad? Why didn't they? You know these kind of things. So, so. You know, I'm not going to sit here and say, you know, I've had a hard life. I've I've had my 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 share of struggles with things, but you know, I'm a strong person, and and I get through those things because I believe that what I'm doing is is the right thing, and I believe I'm, I go about it with respect and with humility. And like I say, I'm thankful for for the opportunities. I know I've had I have friends who who don't come from those kind of backgrounds, so I know the other side of it as well. Uh, I feel I have empathy and and, and understanding for for people's situations. Um, and and that that helps me to to understand that the situation I'm in is extremely privileged and and uh, don't ever take that for granted because it can be gone from one day to the other. It can all be taken away from you. 
when we talk about um, struggle and talk about failure, explain to us how you, in your mind, because we've already mentioned how important self-talk is, how did you reframe moving from Manchester City to Notts County? Because it, anyone that watches football knows that's not a forward step, right? So what were you saying to yourself at that time about turning it into the right thing and the right place to be? Well, it's kind of like it's kind of like when you're trying to get your Wi-Fi to work and it won't work. You keep resetting, you keep resetting, it doesn't work. In the end, you have to turn the computer off yeah. and restart. It was the same thing for me. I had to restart my career. I had to start from the beginning. So I had been at Manchester City. I'd got a, a great football education through so many different people I played with, so many great coaches. I'd had, you know, an amazing upbringing in football in that sense. I'd been out on loan and it all been very um, sporadic and, and you know, didn't, not really a plan. The plan was obviously to get to the, the Premier League, but the plan to get there wasn't actually set. There was no process to it. It was just one day from the other, Darlington needs a keeper for four weeks on an emergency loan. Right, I'm going there. Right, then Barry. Right, I'm going there. Then Falker. Right, I'm going up there. You know, there for me there were steps up every time. You know, going to play from from League Two to play in the Scottish Premier League. You know, that that was a step up. And then going to play in the Championship, but there was no kind of base of right. You 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 almost have this uh, this great life as a youngster in football where at Man City, particularly. I know it's even more now, but you you have everything. Everything's yeah. done for you. You know, you come into training and pitches are beautiful. Your kit's laid out. Your kit is washed. Your boots are done for you. Everything's just right. All you have to do is come in and play. But you obviously learn when you go out on loan that that's not the norm. You know, there's 20 Premier League clubs and, and that's that, that was it. I mean, I know it's changed through the years, but this we're talking like 2004, 5, 6 here. So, you know, things were, were, were a lot different back then. Um, but kind of... When you go on loan, I, I always uh, I always made a point of, of showing people, wanting to show people how much this meant to me, because I knew it was it was uh, it was me becoming a professional footballer, which was my dream. So I was playing professional football against against you know men, big mm. guys who who actually you know who weren't in the privileged position that I was in at City. You know, I was on a good contract and like I say everything was done for me and if if things were to fail, I could always go back there. These guys couldn't do that. So if I made a mistake, that could be the difference between them getting their bonus or not getting their bonus. That could be the difference between them struggling to pay their mortgage or not paying their mortgage, you know? So that's a big responsibility when you're 17, 18, 19 years old. And um and that was so, so important to me. And did you feel the name on the back of your shirt also needed you to act slightly differently to show you were willing to work hard, that you were one of the yeah. lads, if you like? No, my name uh, and my circumstance has always been, you know, I've always had to do everything twice as hard as, as everything, everything and everyone else just to prove that I am willing to do it. Because automatically when you're young, people will think, oh, his dad got him in there, his dad, this, that, the other. You know, so you have to prove that you are there because you're, you know, you're willing to work harder than anybody else. Um, but, but to kind of go back to the point, I always had the, you know, the safety net of going back to City. Yeah. And, uh, and I got to a point where I'd been out on these loans, I'd experienced these highs, you know, as a youngster experiencing um playing at you know against Celtic against Rangers at Ibrox these kind of experiences at my age was incredible and that buzz you can't replace it you want it again going to to Bury and and staying up on the last day you know Bury surviving on the last day being part of something was was incredible so when you then go back to to your parent club and you know f for me that the lots of things went on and and you know I don't really blame the managers uh, for it because they, they'll they have had their reasons. I don't know their reasons, but they'll have had their reasons for, for, for bringing people in or not giving me a chance when I felt I, I, I deserved it, whatever. But I needed to go somewhere where they believed in me and where I could just play and, and not have that safety net. If this goes wrong, this is me, you know? And I got to a point at City where I was traveling to games, but I wasn't on the bench, wasn't playing. And that's not what football's about for me. Football's about playing. 
It's about being part of something. I would much rather play in League Two than sit on the bench in the Premier League. You know, that, that was my kind of mindset. So for me to go to, to Notts County was the reset button. You know, press the reset button and restart and now go somewhere and prove that you can step out of that safety net and and uh, and do something. And, and we did. And it was it was such an amazing season to be part of. So crazy. And, you know, uh, things went on in, you know, with the whole Munto finance and, and things like that. And it it taught me one thing that you can't affect these things. You can only affect what happens on the pitch. And, um, you know, I, I think I, I came there, I got paid the first two two or three months and then I didn't get paid after that. Wow. And, um, and it, again, it was one of those situations, but I didn't, it, not that I didn't care, but it didn't mean that much because I was playing. That was all I ever wanted was to play and we were doing, you know, we're doing all right. And then we got to the end of the season, we, we you know, when Steve Cottrell came in and we just kicked on and won the league. and. Yeah, you know, that was an amazing experience. It's powerful to hear you talk like that because there are lots of people listen to this podcast who are at exactly the point that you were there where they kind of keep on restarting the computer, but eventually they will need to turn it off. The big problem with that, and we talk about it a lot, Damien, is the fear. And that's that's what stops people, Casper. I mean, you must have had fear that I might never play for a Premier League football team again. That would be on your mind, wouldn't it? No, <laughs> I love the fact you just shake your head. No, no, it, I, I, again, never a doubt. Call, call it ignorance, call it arrogance. I, I knew. So the way I grew up, was, it, you know, I studied goalkeeping. I studied yeah. it long and hard and I could see it from, you know, close up. But, you know, when, when the, you know, the, the digital revolution came and YouTube started coming around, I could see other keepers. I could see, you know, I watched the Premier League. I watched everyone else and, and, at that point, I felt I'd done my homework. I'd done my due diligence, and I knew that I had everything in the locker to be a Premier League keeper. All I needed was someone to believe in me, to give me that chance. You know, Sven had given me the chance. He, you know, he'd given me my debut, and you know, again, weird, weird situations went on that, you know, from one day to another, I signed a new contract and didn't play the day after, and things like that. That just think, what, what's going on here? But again. It was things I couldn't affect. So you learn to say, right, I can only affect what I do on the pitch. So I have to be the best every day. Every single day, I wanted to push myself to be the best. I wanted to prove I was the best. I wanted to work harder than anyone else. I wanted to be first in, last out. I wanted to make a point of it that I was the best and you cannot get around me. You know, you can't avoid me. So if it's gonna take a month, a year, three years, dropping down the leagues, I will, not prove you wrong, I will prove myself right. Because I'd done my homework and I knew that I had it in the locker. It was just about getting the opportunity and being given the chance. And Notts County did that. Powerful. Casper, in, but in that period when you were waiting for somebody to believe in you and to give you that chance, how did you keep that flame alive? Where did you go to, to keep nurturing that self-belief and that confidence that must have been taking a battering from not being given the chance for not having the opportunities that you felt you deserved don't get me wrong it was it was tough it was really hard mentally because you, you know you feel you're giving you know you're giving everything you're training you know you hours and hours and hours on end and you know that the, there's all these you talked about at the start of the, of the program about how that how footballers are perceived just because they earn lots of money blah 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 you know people you know you don't feel like as a football you can say you have a tough life because you earn a lot of money people and everyone will always say that well i'd do that for that money so, yeah, you might do but we do it we sacrifice these things so you might say that you would you'd sacrifice missing your kids' birthdays. You you might say you'd sacrifice you know Christmas and New Year's and all these things. You might sacrifice not seeing your friends for months on end because you're training or you're doing this, that, and the other. But we actually do it. So for me, I was I was sacrificing a lot and not getting the opportunity. So that's tough mentally because you know it's not. You know the team when the sheet, team sheet goes up, it's not going to be your name, but. There's that little 1% of hope that's, it might just be, I might just have caught the eye, I might just have done this. But what you learn is you are 
constantly being watched. You are constantly being evaluated. Everything you do from the second you step in, the car you arrive in, the clothes you arrive in, you know, how you act when you arrive at the training ground, go into the dressing room, how you talk to people, do you treat people with respect, you know, how all these things matter to managers and sporting directors and these kind of people. So that it's not just on the pitch. So you have to be perfect in every aspect. So when you aren't getting the opportunity, it becomes tough. It definitely does. So for any of our listeners that, are, that can identify with this, Casper, what kind of techniques did you draw on to keep you consistent and keep showing up and giving your best day after day? Well, for me, it comes down to love. I love playing football. I absolutely love playing football. And, you know, when, when, I, when I went to sleep, you know, you know, my arms used to jerk or something like that because I, in my head I had, you know, I was dreaming football all the time. And I absolutely love playing football. So you, you, you kind of just, every time you get the, the knockback, you say to yourself, well, is it worth it? And you, you look at the guy who's playing in front of you and you think, yeah, it is worth it because I know it'll come. If I keep doing the right things, it will come. I've just got to be patient. So every time you get that knockback, I, I always said to myself, you know, do you love doing it? And, and now I'm at a different stage in my career. Sometimes it's the, you know, the, the days when it's, you know, minus degrees or it's, you know, pissing with rain or whatever it might be. And you think, oh God, you know, you're doing tactical sessions as a keeper, you're stood there freezing. You know, you can't feel your fingers, can't feel your toes and, and things like that. But again, you go to that place in your head, do you love doing what you're doing? Yeah, I love doing what I'm doing. And then the, then you go to the other place for me, which is that trophy. That's the goal. So those days, did you love those days when you'd won the league? Yeah, you did. So this is this is part of the process. You, you've spoken about the challenges of playing for League Two teams because you need to play those games to feed your kids and pay your mortgage. What about the challenges of playing in the Premier League, because I think a lot of people would look at it and go, what do you mean challenges playing in the Premier League? Great money, great life, lovely. But there is a risk, isn't there, that comes with people that achieve success, right? That they just, it, it extinguishes the flame. Were you at all concerned when you won it with Leicester? And did you have to think about, right, I need to make sure that I wake up tomorrow and I still want to be as good as I was yesterday? I think if you're thinking of as, as, as a team, that is a fear because not everyone's the same. You know, for some people, that's the pinnacle, you know, and when you reach the summit, you actually realize when you reach that, that, you know, it's amazing, but then there's this void after where you think, right, well, what's next? I've, I've reached the top of that mountain. What's next? How many times have we heard that, Damien? <laughs> but it's such a good message, though, Casper, for people that are living a life thinking, when I get there, I'll be happy. You're what never... did Matthew McConaughey say? There is no yet. There is exactly, exactly. It, even in his in his in his uh, his Oscar speech, when he when he said, you know, are you your hero yet? Of course you're not. You're never going to reach that. I'm never going to be perfect. I'm never going to be happy or satisfied. I'll always think, ah, oh, if I only had done this or only had done that. But, you know, it, it's finding that happy medium of being thankful for what you have achieved. And if this is my lot in, in life, in football, then okay, that's my lot. But it's not going to stop me chasing. It's not going to stop me working, not going to stop me running because I know the feeling of achievement. And that feeling of achievement, when you have been part of that process, for me, it was a, you know, it, 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 it was a, a, a 15 year battle to, to win that trophy, you know. So you have to hit the reset button again, right? Okay. What now? Now we want to do Talk it. Talk to us about the uh, the phrase "burn your trophies." Well, you can't use it for anything anymore other than motivation for yourself. You know what you've done then matters nothing now. If I'm not playing well, the manager's not going to pick me, regardless whether I won the league with the club or whether I've been at the club for ten years and played however many games. If I'm not performing right now, I'm going to be a burden to the team. So. You can't use that. You can't have that in your, in the back. Well, oh, well, I've done this for you. I've won the league for you. I've done this. It doesn't work. It's always about the next step, right? Well, are you performing now? Are you going to be keep performing? So the older you get, 
the harder you have to work. You have to double down because the youngsters are coming through. You know, they're faster, they're quicker, they're fitter, they're sharper, they're brighter. So you have to keep up. You know, so you have to you have to double down again. So you have to dig even deeper. And that again comes back to do you love doing it? You know, is the process worth the reward? And it for me, it still is. And I can't so imagine. That's a brilliant question. So how do you handle those guys that like being a footballer, but they don't like playing football? They don't like the graft, the work in the shadows when they're your teammates. Listen, it is it is difficult and and I can't give you how many examples of of players who haven't fulfilled their potential. You know, where you think if you just if you had a bit more desire about you, the things you could achieve. But you have to you have to respect that not everyone's the same. You know, like I say, winning the league for some might just be the ultimate, and they might just think that's me done. I'm happy with that, and I'm no I'm I'm not in any position to judge whether that's good enough for them or not. That They're the only ones who, who can judge that. Sure, but if they're colleagues of yours that play their part in helping you get there, how do you handle those guys? Well, that's where the, the role of the, the practical psychologist comes in. You know, as a, as a goalkeeper, you are, you are individual in a team sport. So you have to... You have to learn how to talk to each individual player, and you, the, the the important thing is for me to to get to know each player, what motivates them, what drives them, and then you've got to tap into that. And you've got to, you know, it's the same when I'm when I'm communicating with defenders or, or players. I know this guy needs to be spoken to this way, whereas this guy might need, you know, an arm around his shoulder. This guy needs a, a, a kick up the arse sometimes, or something like that. So. You have to try and find whatever motivates them to get them to perform for all of you so that the team performs. Um, and that can be different things. And motivation comes in so many different forms. Um, so give us some clues then, Casper. How do you go about developing a relationship with teammates then where you can start to understand drivers and motivators and communication styles? Well, it, it's, a, it, it's a strange process in the sense that I've always found, and I, and I know this isn't probably what you'd expect to hear, but things like drinking together, like actually sitting down, having a drink together after a game, having a beer and talking, that is how you get to know people when they loosen off a little bit, you know, because we are, we are in a high pressure environment every day where you have to perform, you have to be at your best. So every now and then when you have that, that break and you can actually just sit yourselves down have a drink and have a chat and actually get to learn to, to know these people that you spend every single day with, but you might actually not know that much about them. Um, and I've always found that the, 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 the nights, the evenings, the dinners where you, you, you actually sit and just talk is, is the, they're the most beneficial to the team because that's when, that's when you get to know the person. So, you, you know, everyone behaves in, in a certain way because of their circumstance you know you don't know what the guy next to you is going through you know he could be you know he could be going through a divorce and you have no idea he could be you know his missus could be expecting a baby their first baby and that's a big thing in their life so it's really important to know because if you're if you're on at someone all the time to be performing 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 but they've got something big going on outside that's distracting them you're not going to get a positive response from that you know, and you, I need him to perform because I can't go and score the goal. I, I'm a goalkeeper. I can only do what comes to me. I can't go looking for work. That's when mistakes happen. I can't go and tackle someone or run harder if, if the game's not going my way. So if I'm shouting at someone and getting on someone and they're pressured from all sides, at some point they're going to blow up and it's not going to be conducive to, to success for, for, for myself, for the team. So I think it's really important to get to know people and, and to, to understand the drivers within them. And when you look back on that remarkable Premier League win at Leicester, how much was the emotional connection between the players one of the most important elements? Yeah, I think, I think the whole Leicester case is a unique case because I've been at many clubs and I've never seen or, or experienced a club that runs the way Leicester does. Right. Um, Explain that. It's the, it was something, I mean, from, from my time, it, it was Nigel who started it, implemented it. You know, you look at our staff now, so many of them are still, are still the people that Nigel employed, you know. But it's the, it's the way they treat people. 
you're treated as a person and you feel important. And that came right from the very top with Kunvichai. The way he treated everybody, you could see the outpouring of grief when he died for a man that these people didn't know. They didn't know the guy. But his the what he's done for the club, the way he he just showed respect to every single person. It didn't matter what position in the club you had. You were just as important. You were part of the machine. And to make the machine work, everyone has to do their part. And that's what it's like in Leicester. You, you, ha- you, ha- you I know, we know who every director is, who every, pe- you know the people who are involved in the club. You know, I've, I've never, you know, been in clubs where you've had a conversation with the CEO or the, or the, or the financial director or whatever. It just doesn't really happen. Or the owner of the club. But does that win games though? It does. It does. Mm. I, um, it really does because you realise. I don't think a footballer doesn't think about what the financial director has to do at a club to get things to go, or what the CEO has to do to make things work. But when you actually again sit down, have a meal with these people, and and hear their daily life, because they're they're a part of the same club as you, but their job depends so much on what you do on the pitch. And the other way around, and you have not—you don't—you probably don't have any idea what they do on a day-to-day basis, even though you have the same workplace, you know. Uh, so I think it's really important that you you, you know everybody within your organisation, and and you have a, a, a humility and respect, and understanding that everybody does a, a job for a reason, and they're there for a reason, you know. And that and in a football club, that reason is to win games. You know, they're not doing it to you. If, if the board are coming, like in, in the corona pandemic, you know, clubs were, 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 you know, were having to go down in wage. It's not them trying to be horrible or be idiots and try and, and this, that, and the other. It's because it's a necessity, you know. And again, the line of communication, the openness and the honesty between the, you know, every level of the club is what makes it so successful. And it, it means that you can respect everyone's point of view. Uh, and that's where Leicester's been been different to every other club I've been at. You know, there, there's been a continuity, there's been a uh, a connection with every level of the club. Yeah, I really but love I- that. Sorry, I was just going to say, Damien, do you know what I really like about that answer from Casper, right, is that everything he's described there about a culture to win a Premier League trophy, there's no magic, there's no secrets, there's nothing there that no one listening to this, running their own business or working in a business can't replicate. It's literally connecting with other people, talking to each other, sharing your emotions, sharing your successes and failures, and the a common shared attack towards one aim. And that is, that's so important for people to hear, I think. I think it's powerful, but I'm also hearing the imagined cries of so many people listening to this going, well, why is it so rare then? So you described that it was unusual, Casper. So your experience of other yeah, clubs might question. help us understand why is it so rare? I don't understand why it's so hard to be a human for so many people. Um, what, many clubs and, and clubs particularly at the moment, you know, the, the, the management position is a revolving door, you know, so people don't actually take the time because they don't have the time. You know, you lose two, three games, you're out. You know, that that's the way football goes. And you don't actually have time to bond with people in that sense. Leicester is is different in the sense we have players who have been there, myself, nearly 10 years. You know, you've still got Wes, you've got Fuxi, you've got, you know, Vaz, Mark Albright. You know, so many players who've been there. And there's a reason they stay. There's a reason they stay because they feel valued. They feel like that they're part of something. And, you know, Mark Albright is the perfect example. Every manager that's come into Leicester has dropped Mark Albright straight away. And every single time... He's worked his way back. He's someone you need to speak to on this podcast because you talk about right. performance, you talk about getting knocked back. That guy just keeps getting back up and keeps fighting and keeps... Will you sort that out for us then? I'll try. No, no. I'll try. No. <laughs> but, but he kind of epitomizes what it's about. Yeah. You know, and you can, you can translate it to every profession because at the end of the day, if you want to achieve something you need people working to their best capabilities. So as a CEO or a leader, that was what Kunvichai did. He made sure everyone felt good. 
He helped people. I mean, the, the amount of stories that came out after he died of people he'd helped that no one knew about. You know, I, I, I've, I've 10 stories of how he helped me in different, in different ways. Of, but it's simple things. It, it's just on a human level, you know, and that, that means so much to people because I think particularly in England, there's, there's, a, there's a society where, you know, there, there's lots of difference between rich and poor, you know, and for someone who has everything, I mean, Kuichai had every reason to be an idiot. He could do whatever he wanted if you want. Like, no, who's going who's gonna to say anything against him? The guy's a billionaire, but he chose not to. He chose to be a nice guy. He chose to be a good person. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that's really difficult when you have that amount of wealth. And I think people get surprised. Oh, my days, he, you know, he shaking my hand, going right, saying that, well, not shaking at the hand at the moment, but, you know, we, 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 <laughs> fist, fist, bump, fist yeah. bump at the moment. <laughs> but, but you know what I mean? It just little tiny touches like that, like just saying good morning. How are yeah. you? You know, not, instead of just walking past people in, in, in the tunnel that, or or in the stadium, if he's, if you know, going up past the... Uh, Pass someone, it, just acknowledge them, say hello, how are you? It, it, it's quite simple. So Casper, when somebody comes and joins your Leicester dressing room then, and maybe doesn't quite get this, so maybe does come in full of airs and graces or uh, with, a, with a little bit of swagger, how do you induct them to understand that that doesn't carry much currency in your world? Oh, they'll understand it. They'll, 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 they'll get to understand it. But again, it comes from the top. It comes from the top, and again, not many players sign for a club and and meet meet the owners or the CEO. Or the, you know, they'll meet the sporting director and the manager and sign. You know, doesn't really happen. But I think a lot of the time that happens at Leicester. You know, you you, you feel valued, you feel welcome. Um, you're coming into a squad that a lot of established players who know what the club's about, and they'll know who you are, and they'll have respect for that. But again, a team has to be made. You can't just have 11 workhorses on the pitch. You have to have the, the, the flamboyant, the, uh, you know, the, the, the prima donna or the, uh, you know, the, the, the person in the you know, James Madison pink boots. And you have to have these characters to form a good team. You, know, you can't just have 11 or, or 23 of, of the same or 25 of the same people. So you have, you know, we, we've, we've been... You know, in Leicester, the, the recruitment's been. You, you've had your. You started with Anthony Knockhart. You had then Riyad Mahrez came in. You know, these kind of players, you'd say, don't fit the mold of a Leicester player. But that's you, you have to have that difference as well. Yeah. And like I say, that X factor. You so take for example Riyad. Riyad was able to do what he did at Leicester because of someone like Danny Simpson. Because he knew that Danny Simpson, he wasn't the overlapper. He wasn't the one who was going to come and create with him. But he knew he could just go because Simo would sit there and cover him. So if he lost the ball, Simo was there. You know, so that kind of unlikely duo worked brilliantly. You know, so that gave Riyad the, the freedom and, and the, you know, the, the ability just to express himself and, and do his thing. And his thing, he saw things differently. You know, he, he sees things you know, passes that I don't see or any or other people don't see. And that's what sets Jamie Vardy up for goals. That's what creates confusion because he knows the guy behind him. He's uh, He's got his back if, if that's the case. And like I say, the makeup of a team is, is, is very, very, uh, very important because you have to have different personalities. You have to have the, you know, the hard hitting, the winners, the real, the drivers. You've got to have people who can calm situations down. You have, you've got to have loads of different kind What's of... What's your role there? Um, I don't know. I, I don't be so modest. Come on now. No, I, I mean, I, I try to lead by example. You know, I try to to do the right things as as much as I can. You know, I, I, I try to always be the hardest worker in the room. Um, Why is you know, that important to you? Well, because I, I think it's the right thing to do, and, and I, I think it's important to show, you know, at the age that I'm, I'm at, that that it still means the world to me. You know, winning still means everything to me. And they have to see that I'm willing to sacrifice. I'm willing to work just as hard, harder than anybody else to get there. You know, and um, yeah, my role is, is, is to communicate and to, to, uh, to play as well as I can, be steady. The best games I ever have are the ones you don't notice me in. 
they're the best games I have because then I've done my job perfectly with my defense. You know, that's where we have been in perfect tandem and we have uh, we've stopped chances from occurring. So for me, it's never been about be you know making great saves and being eye catching this that and the other. It's been about just finding consistency so that the team know that they can depend on me. And um, and that's not that's never really changed. That's always been my view on goalkeeping. Is is the best goalkeepers are the ones you you probably don't really notice that much and the ones that people call underrated. The big problem with with goalkeeping from uh, my perspective, standing on the sidelines alongside normally strikers, Casper, as you know, talking about goalkeepers, is that the midfielders or the strikers can miscontrol the ball four or five times a game, misplace a pass, no problem. You do it once and it leads to a goal. You are operating at the absolute edge of failure. And we love people to get to that point because it's only when you're right on the edge of failure that you're really finding out what your limits are. How do you become comfortable with millions of people watching every single game you play with failure, the fact that you deal in a world where millimetres is what matters. You've, you've actually said the opening line of, uh, of, of when I do go out and, and, and do speeches to people, that is, I work in millimetres. That's my first line. Really? Tell us the rest. It sounds good. Oh, you, you, haven't got, you haven't got that long, trust me. No, it, but it, it, that's, that is genuinely the slightest millimetre is the difference between success and failure in my profession. And as a goalkeeper, you cannot make mistakes. You have to be perfect. Any mistake will cost your team. Um, that is what you, they say. I always hear this thing that goalkeepers are crazy, this, that, the other. Yeah, to, to accept and love and revel in that responsibility, you have to be crazy because like you say, you are operating on the edge of failure every single time. So... You have to love that you are the guy who has to be perfect every time. Enjoy that. I, I think I don't think you can be a keeper if you don't enjoy that. Um, you have to accept failure as part of the game. It is absolutely part of the game, and you, I, I will dissect every single goal that goes in and think I should have saved that. Everything doesn't matter how it goes, whether it's. Near post, as your commentators love to uh, love to talk about, which is which is rubbish. But any goal that yeah. goes in, I will always look at it and think, I should have done that. I could have done that. Why didn't I do that? This, yeah, you know, I will always find a reason why I didn't save it and say I should have done something else. Um, every- I remember um, a game against Bournem- Bournemouth not long ago when you came out in the press afterwards, didn't you? Did you not yeah. accept? You sort of accepted responsibility for for that defeat for Leicester. How quickly on the pitch are you able to recover from? being annoyed with yourself or making mistakes because for people listening to this recovering is su- such an important not dwelling on those mistakes is, is vital what can I do about it I can't do anything about it now so the worst thing I can do now is to back it up with another mistake so it's about recomposing yourself resetting again okay that's happened we start again because as a keeper when you come looking for work that's when trouble happens. It's the same as, as, a, as a tennis player serving for Wimbledon. You know, if he serves differently because the, you know, he's gonna win, he could win this, he won't serve right. It has to be complete muscle memory, complete belief, faith and reliance on your ability. So again, if you've done your homework, then you have no... Re- because you have to accept that the mistakes will happen. You can be as prepared as you want. You can train as hard as you want. Mistakes will happen. But you have to be able to look yourself in the mirror and say, I've done everything. All right, I made a mistake. So that did you happens. play it over in your mind mid-game? When the ball's no, at the end of the picture, you're thinking, no, right, no. really? It's got, no, you, like, when it happens, you think, you know, I can't say the words I was thinking. But, you know, it's gone. I can't do anything about that now. The only thing I can affect is the next bit. You know, and and... For me, I had to accept responsibility because we were in control and that goal shifted momentum. That shifted the momentum of the game. And as a team, Cags got sent off and we, we, we didn't deal with the shift in momentum well enough. Um, and again, like I say, I can't do it all myself. I can't go out and, and make things happen. Uh, and that's, that's, the real, that's probably the most difficult part of goalkeeping. You know, we, we, we take our game against uh, against Crystal Palace the other week. Um, 
the whole game, my entire game plan, everything I wanted to do in that game came off perfectly. And ball comes to the back post, Zaha kicks it, it takes deflection off James Justin and goes under my arm. And I know for a fact that the cameras won't pick up on the deflection and the people in the studio won't pick up on the deflection. But I know there's nothing I can do about that. I cannot do anything about that. I, the ball was coming straight to my chest and I was going to catch it. But the deflection took it under my arm and it looked strange. And I know in my head straight away that that's going to be my fault in people's perception. But I know it's not my fault. I know I could have done nothing about that because of the deflection. So that rids me of, of any blame in my head, which means I move on straight away. Straight away, move on. I couldn't have done anything different. There's yeah, a real so, paradox here, Casper, as I'm, as I'm listening to it, that, that I'm intrigued about, that, that part of what you've described is you sound to me like a risk taker. You know, if we go back in terms of your career, that you took that risk of leaving Manchester City and going to Notts County because yeah. you wanted to play and that you were happy to reset. And yet the nature of your role is that you play not to lose. Don't you? Your job is to almost be defensive, and yet you're a guy that takes risks. And you've just said the paradox is if you go looking for those risks, you're actually harming the team. So how do you square that circle? Again, it comes down to the type of goalkeeper you want to be. And the game has changed so much from when I made my debut for Darlington to where we are now. So take a club like Leicester. Leicester have been, you know, an up and down club in for many years. And we, we finally now have stability, what you'd call real stability. And we have a manager who is, you know, who's world class and we have everything in place to be world class. So the way we play, for example, take our, our style of play. Leicester fans won't be used to seeing that. They won't be used to seeing their keeper trying to be creative with the ball. But that's what I'm being asked to do, you know. I'm not being asked to take chances. It's not that. But, you, you know, the, take the Bournemouth kick. That was a perfect kick. When I look at that back, what I was trying to do would have happened if it hadn't hit Wilf. That was, that was unlucky that it, that it happened. But... Yeah. It was something we'd worked on. Dennis Pratt had dropped into the pocket and the ball would have been perfect. I knew it from the second I hit the, hit the shot that I'd hit the ball perfectly. But there are other variants that you can't, can't do anything about. But as a keeper, now you're being asked to play out from the back. So when you do that, naturally, more risk is, is taking and when when we had fans you know you, you could feel the crowd when you when I've got the ball and they just wanted to kick it long you know they used they're not used to seeing that so they have to understand that they'll 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 judge someone they'll judge a goalkeeper distribution if the ball goes if they hit over hit at one shot but a midfielder can do that loads of times they can make mis passing mistakes all the time we can't make passing mistakes we have to be perfect every single time because if we're not we lose, or we, or we we potentially there's a big big risk that we lose the game. So you have to again do your homework. You have to train every single day. You have to do these things. So so for me, we, you know, I train a lot with the outfielders to make sure that I can do these things, but also that they know I can do them. So they trust me. They know they can bounce the ball back to me, and I can control it. You know, they know that if they give me a difficult ball to my left foot or to my right foot, I can still do something constructive with it. And the way goalkeeping is now, you are now required to be constructive with your with your play. So when you have the ball at your feet, you're required to produce something that you're not not, not that you have to hit, you know, the, the 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 definite, you know, assist pass, but you have to play into a system which is designed to get you up the pitch. And sometimes that short passes between people which look risky. But that's part of the game now. The game's changed, so you have to evolve with it. And all of this is going on in the, the sort of most public arena you can imagine. Not just the fans in the stadium. Um, we can't wait till that is happening again. But everyone at home and your teammates and former teammates and pundits and other managers and your opponents who are watching you as well. So how do you go about removing all the ego from this so that it doesn't become about you and then it doesn't become internalized in those big moments where you need to make a save you know it's 
it's a challenge, isn't it, not to kind of let pride be the centre of everything that you do, Casper? I think ego is a really interesting aspect because I have a massive ego, but I'm also a massive team player. Um, right. So how do the two work together? Well, they work together in the sense that the, the, the pride I have in not conceding is so big and it, it hurts me if it's in training, it, you know, it, ah, oh, it kills me every time a goal goes in, it annoys the hell out of me. But you have to sometimes remove the pride, remove the ego, because if you are too hung up, it's like burning a trophy. So if you're too hung up on, on what you've done, what you've achieved, who you are, then you're not focused on now. You're not focused on who you are right now. You know, you're focused on something that was, and you might not be the same person. You might not be the same player. You know, so uh, I talk a lot about removing the ego from situations, it, and you can, you know, you can probably even go back. You can take this to a different analogy of of, of maybe in 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 the business world of, of Blockbuster back in the day when they had the opportunity to buy Netflix. Maybe the ego is too big to, you know, we're too big for this. That won't be a challenge, yeah. and you see what happens. And it's the same here. You have to remove that ego and say, "Well, I am also just a very small cog in the big machine." You know, so this isn't about me. Even though individually my performance is about me, my individual performance. But at the end of the day, I don't really care if I played bad or great, as long as we win. Is that That's true? That's most important. And it's the same thing about. I, I always get asked this thing about clean sheets. Like, clean sheets mean nothing to me. They mean nothing. As long as we win, I don't care. Right. I do not care. But that's interesting, though, for someone who admits they have a bit of an ego. And, and I, by the way, can I just say, I don't think that saying I've got an ego should be seen as a negative thing. No. I mean, we, we've already discussed, you've admitted you've got an ego. You admitted you went to a League Two football club as a young guy and still believed you'd win the Premier League. Like... What's the point thinking anything else, Casper? And I wish people would understand this. What's the point thinking bad stuff negatively about yourself? What I can't see a benefit, can you? I, I can't because like we talked about, I can control what's in here. So I, I talk a lot to the younger keepers about when they make mistakes. If it, you know, I used to be real aggressive to myself making mistakes and my coaches, and all, they're like, stop doing that you don't you don't need to show that you've made a mistake because I don't know if you've made a mistake so that's why I keep telling these youngsters if they you know if they're doing something and they're trying to catch it and they haven't quite caught it and they get angry with themselves style it out make it look as if that's exactly what I was trying to do I'm in control here that was exactly what I was trying to do don't let me know that you're annoyed with yourself because that just gives people ammo to come for you say oh yeah that was that was pretty bad people are going to come for you anyway don't give them any more ammunition and control the controllable. So don't go on social media. Don't read about yourself because what are you going to gain by that, by someone else's opinion of you? Because it's so easy to have a negative opinion of someone and tweet it or write it anonymously. So does it impact you, social media, other people's opinions? Not at all. I don't read it. I don't what, read it. I, what if you did? Oh, no, no way. Really? Wouldn't no, bother you. What would I win from that? What, like, that's the question. What can I gain from doing that? Because if you do that, you might read a hundred really nice comments, but you'll look at the one bad comment and that'll be the one you obsess over. So it's almost like the horses having blinkers on. Don't look at it. Have your people. So I have my people. I have my board my board of directors that I discuss things with. So I will go to my trusted people when it comes to football, when it comes to personal life, when it comes to business, when it comes to anything. I'll have the people that I trust, their opinions. So goalkeeping, I'll go to former coaches that I, I still have a good relationship with. I'll go with certain teammates, certain former teammates, certain colleagues and discuss it with them. And I value their opinions. And that's the input I'll get. And that's the input I'll take. And it's so important. I don't want yes men. I want people to tell me their honest opinion. If I've done something dumb or if it's some, if I'm doing something or if they've spotted something that in my game that's, that they think, oh God, you should stop doing that or something like that. And 
one example when I was when I was younger. I used to take the ball. I didn't notice I was doing it at all for a goal kick. I used to take it, throw it up behind me and catch it like that. And one of my old coaches said, what are you doing with that? You look an idiot doing that. You look, you look cocky. If I'm a striker and he's doing that, I'm thinking, you idiot, I'm going to come and, you know, I'm going to come and smash it. You know, so it might be anything like that. Little things that I may not have picked up on might be doing it subconsciously. But you, you have to realise that, like you said, Jay, you're being evaluated constantly everything you're doing is being evaluated and uh, I can control what I take into my mind I can't control what people are going to write about me in papers and social medias and all that and again I've done my homework I know if I've had a bad game or if if I've had a great game I know I don't need validation from Twitter or Instagram or, or, or Sky Sports or BT or whoever it may be. I don't need that validation because I know if I've done it right and I know if I've done it wrong. So what's your selection criteria for being a member of the board then, Casper? Um, honesty is the main one. You've got to be honest. So like I say, even if it hurts, even if it's uncomfortable conversation, I want you to say it. I want you to, you know, the, the, the whole... The whole aim, the whole goal of it is, in, is to improve. That's the whole goal, is to get better. So how are we going to get better? We're not going to get better by patting each other on the shoulder and saying, oh, you're brilliant, mate. Oh, wow, that's great. No, no, you made no mistakes. You know, you're not going to improve by that. You're only going to improve by constructive criticism. It's, never, it's not like someone's going to come and, you know, just slaughter you for something. It's, it's little things. It's, it's, it's saying things in a constructive way and analysing and sometimes you do say, yeah, just listen, you're playing great at the moment. Everything you're doing is spot on at the moment. So can you give us an example of the most valuable piece of feedback that you've received from this board that, that you're still using today? <sighs> oh, wow. I mean, it's a constant thing, you know. It's hard to say one particular one, but it goes from everything. It goes from... from from body language, it goes from the kit I wear. Like I've had people say, "I don't like that kit. That doesn't look. It doesn't look right. You don't look big in the goal." Or so, things like that. Anything. And and have you got a number one sort of mantra that you've either created yourself or been given that you will always go to when times are tough? Um, <sighs> I don't know if I've got a mantra. I think everything just comes down to love. Do you love doing it? Again, like I said before, do you love doing this? And I said it before, uh, I'm not doing this, I'm not working this hard to prove anybody wrong. I'm doing it to prove myself right. That, that, that's probably the, the, the most, the one I'd, I'd go f- for the most. Here's the question then, um, before we get onto our quick fire questions to finish off. Um, I think if I asked this question to you when you were 17, your answer would be to win the Premier League. So let me ask it to you now. How, what are you now, 30, 31? <laughs> 34. <laughs> <laughs> you got years yeah, left. Yeah, that, yeah. Years left, Casper. Um, uh, let me ask it to you now. Then, as a thirty-four-year-old, not as a teenager, for you now, what is a good life lived? Wow, that's deep. I mean, a good life. You're talking professionally or a good life for you when you come to the end and you take that final breath out. What is a good life lived? Uh, I mean, that that the, the good life lived is is my family having them around me um you know me basically seeing my family happy that's the that's the only thing that matters to me football is is a is a great a massive part of my life but there's nothing that comes close to to what it means to have your family around you um i've i have been away from my family for for large large periods i've missed large periods of my kids lives and football gives you a lot. It also takes a lot. Um, so the day I retire, uh, I will really look forward to the everyday of being with my children and being with my family and actually being a, a dad in, like, in the sense of being able to be there when, you're, when your kids are, are hurt, you're not at a hotel or you're not been away for 12 days with the national team, if they need your help, if they need you for, for homeschooling, homework, whatever it may be, uh, to be able to be there for them 
support them and see them happy, see them thriving. That 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 would be a life well lived for me. So when you mention this, so just to follow on from that, Casper, when you speak about your obvious love of playing football has shone through in most of the answers that you've given us. How do you intend to find the next thing that you can fall in love with beyond your family for when you finish playing? I have, well, this is the thing. I, I have, I don't fear the day I can't play anymore. I, I look forward to it in a positive way. There's, it's as if there's a whole new world opening up for me. You know, all of a sudden there's possibilities every single direction. Um, football will always be there in some capacity, whatever capacity that may be. Um, but it, you know, it's like, uh, yeah, it's, it's like a, it's life's a buffet. All of a sudden, you choose your direction and try. It. I want to try things. I want to travel. I want to, I want to go back to all these places I've played in and actually see them, not just see the airport and the hotel and the stadium. I've actually re- always really made a point of everywhere I've gone with the national team. I'm, I'm lucky I've got teammates and, and, and a particular goalkeeper coach for Denmark who really loves to go for walks. So, so many times, night, night before games, we'll go for a long, long walk in the city. You know, hoods up, hats on and all that so no one can see who we are. But we'll go for a long, long walk and actually just see the cities that we're in, see the places where we are. And I'd love to go back to so many of these places um, and, and experience them again. I'd love to travel, I'd love to take my children, show them the world show them all these places that I've been and, and experience them with them. Um, but yeah, it, it's almost, it's actually really, really exciting uh, what what lies ahead. Um, so I, probably if you'd asked me that question when I was 17, I'd have feared that day, but but I definitely don't. I mean, there, there's, for me, in my head, there's a long, long time before that will happen and my, my kids will be, will be in their late teens by the time that will happen. But... You know that's uh, that's the the that's the gift and the the price of football at the same time. And can and can I ask you one last question? We've not really ha- found anywhere to squeeze it into this, but one of the big themes that we picked up on the podcast series, Casper, is the futility of comparisons. You know, comparing you, your insides to other people's outsides, and yet you've been born into a family where comparisons are going to be inevitable. And you've chosen to go into an industry where those comparisons get even harder. What advice would you have for anyone listening to this about coping with comparisons and what you've learned from it? I think I think going into it, I was probably very naive. I didn't think the comparison was going to be that big. Um, and kind of the, it, yeah, it was. And uh, I was already in it that deep. I couldn't really change it, but I'm being, you know, I'm being compared with one of the best goalkeepers ever. So, you know, so I don't know. It, it's one of those standards is what you set yourselves, and standards in my family are different to maybe other families. So I've won one Premier League. We we've won five. We've won six in my family now. You know, that's the standards. So for me. Getting a professional career wasn't enough, you know. My dad won the Premier League. He won the Champions League as captain. You know, he played. He has the record appearances for his country. That's the standard, you know. So that gives me something to strive for. You know, that gives me motivation. That you know, these things. You know, we we got to. I've got to do at least something that that's similar. I think winning the league with Leicester is 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 a unique experience, but. You know, I'm still four short. You know, so that that gives you something to chase. But um, but, but it's it's something that lifts you up and powers you on. It's not something that um, overwhelms you. No, it, it, it doesn't really bother me anymore. It, it it's actually it, it uplifts me because of who my dad was or is what was as a player. Um, it, it's it's the. It's the mindless, endless questioning of the same thing, you know. So you, you 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 can't really have a press conference. It's particularly like when you go international football, you know, journalists who don't normally have access to you have access to you. So they want to ask you the same thing over and over and over again. And still, at the age of thirty-four, people are still asking me about these things, 
you know, you know I'm a grown man with, with, with kids and, and a life and, and you still, be, you know, people, people I, I, had, I heard Martin Keown, it was one of my friends sent a, like a video clip of Martin Keown calling me young Caspish Mike. People still see me as a child. You thought I was 30. Yeah. I'm 34, but I'm seen as someone's son. I can't change that. It doesn't, I've, that's, that's what I've had to accept. You can win the league. You can be 34, have kids, all this. You're still someone's son. Yeah. I can't change that. So why fight it? It's the only thing I can be is me. And that's good enough for me. If people want to compare, let them compare. I can't do anything about that. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. What a brilliant and strong way to, to finish the interview. What stands out for me is the fact that you've, life has been broken down into the challenge of being born as the son of Peter Schmeichel, the the failure of having to drop away from Man City and go down to the bottom, having to win the Premier League and work out how you don't let that derail you. You know, you've clearly thought every single stage about the bigger picture, um, yet amongst all of that big picture stuff, still been able to focus on yourself to deliver in those games. And the combination of the two is an example of unbelievable emotional intelligence. And um, it's a pleasure for you to not just sit here and share it with us, but it makes me feel positive about the game of football. And this is why I don't feel we give footballers enough credit or enough love because look what you are and we just break you down as people that kick a ball about. And I hope that that changes. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure and uh, keep going. I'm, I'm looking forward to your next ones. <laughs> Good man. Thank you, Casper. Please hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, give us a thumbs up, leave a review, but somehow get involved with the High Performance Podcast and become part of our growing community. Thanks for being part of the adventure.